You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. In what has been one of the strangest quarters in modern history, COVID-19 has brought record volatility and unprecedented uncertainty in the financial markets. Economies around the globe have slammed on the brakes. Travel and hospitality industries have virtually disappeared and oil prices have plummeted. But what does this mean for the Canadian dollar? On this episode of Market Points, we hear from Sean Osborne, Managing Director and Chief Currency Strategist at Scotiabank. Uh, well, thanks for being on the podcast, Sean. Thanks for taking the time today. My pleasure. Uh, so we've, we hear the word unprecedented being thrown around a lot these days. What's your take on what we've been through and, um, you know, what does it look like for you where we're headed? Well, it just seems a never-ending uh, process of uh, a situation of, of um, events and developments, which um, we just have no comparison to in, in, in the modern era. Um, I saw recently, I think, a, a comment that was attributed to uh, Lenin, of all people, and he apparently said there are decades where nothing happens and weeks where decades happen, and it, it feels a lot like that. Um, over the course of um, March, we've seen massive volatility in, in markets generally, clearly a, a significant decline in equity markets, um, uh, a price war developing in the uh, oil markets, and all this volatility essentially being driven by the evolution of the COVID-19 outbreak and the um, enforced stop um, to economic activity um, in pretty much the entirety of the Western world now uh, following the um, hiatus that we've seen in activity in China um, has driven markets to um, these um, unprecedented levels of, of volatility and, and losses, as you say, Greg. The, the fact that they've, let's say, just talking about the equity markets, have made a little bit of a comeback lately. Is that also sort of surprising given uh, given it's not like the, the news has started to turn around? Is that just uh, because of the positive action that governments are taking? Uh, I, I think to some extent, everything seems to be happening at such a, a, a much more rapid pace these days uh, than ever before. Um, we saw through March um, in the space of a little over three weeks, uh, a 35% decline in the S&P 500, for example, um, and through the latter part of March, as the uh, global central banks kind of rallied around uh, to address this problem, um, slashed interest rates, pushed money into the system um, in, in, again, unprecedented um, levels, we've seen equity markets rally and um, recover almost 20%, in fact, to the recent um, high that we saw on, uh, late last week. So. Um, we've gone in and out of a bear, a bear market by some interpretations of that uh, status in in, um, in less than a month, which is um, an incredibly short period of time. And yet the expectation going forward is that we are going to be facing an unprecedented stop in, in economic activity. Yes, that's uh, that's right. I think the uh, the enforced kind of um, uh, social distancing um, and uh, shut out um, or shut in effectively of of, um, uh, of, of uh, particularly in North America and now the enforced um, uh, absence of work um, will uh, will engender a very significant uh, reduction in economic activity. Uh, this is not like your your typical recession where things have um, uh, for various economic reasons perhaps. Um, We've seen economic um, activity slow. Um, interest rates have risen um, to a point where e the economy slows down. This is an enforced um, uh, mandatory uh, halt to e all economic activity, effectively non-essential economic activity. Um, and we think it's going to be pretty brutal. Our forecast at Scotiabank is that um, for uh, the US economy, for example, we're likely to see in the second quarter, um, in annualized terms, a decline of around 20%. In, in GDP. Uh, again, never seen anything like that, uh, certainly in the modern era, um, to compare that to. Um, and for Canada, something um, even, even more severe than that um, uh, in, the, um, in the region, 24% in terms of um, the, the decline in um, economic activity. So um, we do think that um, growth is likely to rebound quite, uh, quite quickly 
um, once this virus situation is under control, um, and obviously we're hopeful that that happens relatively soon, but um, there's still an enormous amount of uncertainty about when that will actually be the case. Um, but for the moment, we do expect um, a rebound in activity, a fairly significant rebound in activity in the second half of the year for both the US and Canada. Uh, but that's still going to leave um, uh, the US economy down likely around 2% for the year overall. Uh, for Canada, a slower recovery from a deeper, um, a deeper contraction. Uh, it's going to leave the Canadian economy down around 4% uh, for the year overall. So recessionary conditions um, likely to prevail for, for certainly the, um, the bulk of this year. And of course, the Canadian dollar has taken quite a slide through March. What's behind that? Well, the Canadian dollar, like um, most of the other commodity currencies, um, uh, affected very much by um, situations like this where economic growth slows. They're, they're sensitive to um, the global economic environment. Um, slower growth usually means less demand for commodities. Um, so the currencies like, for example, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, but also some of the Latin American currencies, um, as well as the Mexican peso, um, are termed uh, the sort of um, high, higher beta currencies. They're more sensitive to um, slower and, um, and stronger growth. They react more. Um, there is more sensitivity to um, economic conditions for, for those currencies. Uh, so with this um, uh, enforced stop to um, pretty much all economic activity, we've seen since the start of the year, the commodity currencies generally have underperformed. Uh, the the um, Australian dollar, for example, down uh, 12% or so. Um, the New Zealand dollar down something similar year to date. The Canadian dollar actually to this point has, has been a relative outperformer, but um, its losses have been compounded um, over the past few weeks by uh, the outbreak of an oil price war, which is um, an unfortunate coincidence with the um, uh, the COVID-19 situation that we have. Uh, oil producers, um, um, essentially Saudi Arabia and um, and uh, Russia, oversupplying a market that's very short on demand at the moment and leading to a situation where oil prices have fallen significantly uh, so far this year. Um, WTI itself is down 60% just in March alone. Um, and down 70% um, so far uh, this year. The prices for um, some of the Canadian heavy crude blends, some of the benchmarks that is essentially that we follow in Canada, uh, they've traded at less than $5 a barrel um, in the past few days. So um, um, a combination of very weak demand as the global economy uh, grinds to a halt and oversupply um, as producers fight for market share um, has driven this situation where uh, storage capacity, both on land and sea, um, is reaching a limit. And we may be in a situation um, just to make a very bizarre, uh, an unlikely situation, even more bizarre, uh, a situation in the, in the near future where, uh, unless demand picks up significantly, storage will be at a limit. And it may well come down to um, producers effectively paying refiners uh, to take uh, product off their hands, so negative oil prices in in essence for the physical market. Um, so that's a, that's a, obviously a highly unusual situation, which has compounded the pressure on the Canadian dollar. Um, and we've fallen quite dramatically. We've fallen eleven and a half percent in March alone, um, and pushed back to the sixty eight cent point, which interestingly enough was the low point in um, twenty sixteen when oil prices were also under uh, quite a bit of pressure. We had um, Oil prices falling to around twenty-six dollars a barrel in WTI terms. Back then, we've fallen to around uh, twenty dollars a barrel for WTI um, in the past few days. So, a very similar sort of situation in that respect for the Canadian dollar. Weak oil prices has been um, a key part of the Canadian dollar story here. Um, but similar to twenty sixteen, we have um, appeared to stabilize a little bit around uh, around this sixty-eight cent point now. And the Canadian dollar has actually managed to stabilize and come back um, to a little under 72 cents at the moment. And I think we may be in a something of a range trade um, for now for the Canadian dollar, at least. Um, I don't think we'll see that much more pressure uh, unless we see a significant deterioration in the outlook for the virus situation, for example. Uh, a lot of bad news is already priced into the Canadian, do Canadian dollar here at, um, at, at these kind of levels. So I rather think that downside for the, for the Canadian dollar uh, from here is relatively limited. Um, but equally, uh, while oil prices stay as low as they are, there's very little chance, I think, that the Canadian dollar rallies. Uh, 
um, that significantly. So we're probably likely to pivot around a couple of cents either side of 70 cents for the next uh, few weeks. Now, through the uncertainty, essentially. Uh, yes, I think, um, we're, as I said, we're hopeful that um, uh, the virus situation has only a, a sort of limited, uh, very pronounced, but limited in terms of the time frame impact on economic activity. Now, a lot depends on um, how quickly, um, especially in the US. I mean, I think the Canadian authorities are, are, um, are listening to um, the medical advice and the science behind um, epidemic outbreaks. Um, but obviously, given the, the nature of the a fairly porous border between Canada and the US, um, we can only uh, really march to the beat of, um, of what happens in, in the US. And we're assuming, uh, we're hoping that um, the impact of, um, of the virus is relatively short lived. The economic consequences will be significant, uh, but we're hopeful that we can uh, move on to uh, recovery in the second half of the year. If we see the virus situation persist, and become more serious in the US, for example, and that obviously delays recovery quite significantly. How, how would you score the Canadian government uh, policy action relative to our neighbors to the south? How, how, how's the Canadian government been handling this? I think overall, um, in, in a, a pretty comprehensive and, and, and um, very uh, pragmatic uh, way, we've seen um, a kind of three pronged approach from um, the federal government, in terms of its fiscal support for uh, for the economy, significant um, around 82 billion Canadian dollars thus far in terms of um, income support and um, tax deferrals, uh, aimed at offsetting the the initial impact of this uh, this downturn or in, enforced um, unemployment for for people. Um, that was announced um, uh, or, or heralded by the uh, finance minister at the same time, the Bank of Canada. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago announced a significant reduction in interest rates and sitting at the same table was the uh, the bank regulator who announced some relaxation in um, uh, capital requirements for banks, allowing banks effectively to um, lend more money at a time when obviously there's a um, higher demand for uh, credit in, in very difficult circumstances. So I think the initial response from the federal government, uh, the Bank of Canada, um, and the bank regulators here in Canada was actually um, um, uh, the full court press that um, uh, we haven't seen actually in, in other countries, a, a, a response as um, united, if you like, as, as we've seen in Canada it hasn't been matched, I think, by um, other countries. And of course, we've seen since then uh, the Bank of Canada follow up with more rate cuts and um, its first foray into asset purchases, not necessarily quantitative easing, as Governor Polos uh, try to make the distinction um, when this was announced, but um, large scale asset purchases aimed at essentially ensuring markets um, continue to function normally. Are, are the central banks in, in uh, the leading economies starting to coordinate their efforts here? Or are they just taking the lead from the Fed? I think there has been some attempt at coordination. We're not quite, um, I think, back to this sort of heyday of, of G7 central bank coordination of the um, 80s and, and perhaps early 90s. Um, there, there has been a bit of a struggle, it seems, to uh, come to a, a united uh, front on um, on a statement of intent. Um, there's been a, a couple of attempts, apparently, to get a statement out um, that um, uh, would present a united front. It's been a bit difficult, I think, for various reasons. Um, beyond this particular issue, uh, to to get um, get that statement out, but um, in essence, the uh, the Federal Reserve is is leading um, uh, other G7 central banks, other large uh, major economy central banks, I think, in its in its efforts and becoming essentially the uh, the central bank central bank by ensuring that um, there is adequate not just domestic um, support for um, economic activity, but um, uh, a key issue that uh, we saw emerge initially in this crisis as markets started to um, freeze up was uh, just a, a shortage of dollar liquidity outside of the US. Uh, the dollar is the global medium of transaction. It's the basis of uh, a lot of borrowing, a lot of credit um, products around the world. Um, a lot of inventory and trade is conducted in, um, in, in US dollars. Um, and uh, in times like this, when markets start to freeze up, banks become reluctant to lend. Um, um, owners of US dollars tend to hold US dollars and um, not um, not allow them to circulate more freely around the economy, if you like, or the financial system. So there was 
um, quite a severe shortage of, of the US dollar funding, the US dollar liquidity offshore. And the, the Fed has done a, a magnificent job, I think, of um, ensuring access to uh, dollar liquidity um, globally uh, in, in a way that um, is, again, unprecedented, even, even on a grander scale that we saw in the, uh, in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, just to make sure that the um, global financial system continues to, to function and, again, avoid those disorderly market conditions that um, central bankers really abhor. Does that mean we should uh, expect a stable U.S. dollar going forward over the next few months? Um, it's a good question. I think the dollar tends to benefit in times of uncertainty um, to some extent. It's, it's maybe not the sort of classic fo- foreign exchange safe haven that we tend to think of, um, like the yen or the Swiss franc. Uh, but if there is a, um, a shortage of, there is a liquidity premium in effect on, on the dollar. Um, and um, as we saw in 2008, um, in that initial phase of, of the housing crisis, when liquidity was again very tight, um, the dollar rallied and rallied quite significantly. Um, so we did see some signs of that uh, dollar strength emerging uh, with the Canadian dollar, as I say, falling to that 68 cent point um, in March. Other currencies were under quite significant pressure as well. Sterling fell below uh, 120 into the teens. The euro was under um, a fair bit of pressure as well. Um, but as the Fed has um, addressed this liquidity issue and um, ensured um, an adequate supply, um, an overabundance in in, in by some measures, um, of dollar liquidity, uh, the dollar has actually slipped back a little bit now. And I think we may well um, be in the early stages of um, some sort of retrenchment um, in, in the US dollar against most currencies. It may be a little bit slow in coming against the Canadian dollar. We have that oil price issue uh, still as a, a drag on the Canadian dollar's performance. But um, um, the Fed really has um, um, pledged unlimited support uh, for the economy, so in unlimited uh, quantitative easing, in effect, and it keeps on um, wheeling out these new programs to ensure that there is adequate dollar liquidity um, in the uh, in the global financial system. And I think that will um, tend to weigh on the U.S. dollar uh, over time. Again, as we saw in the um, in the wake of the financial crisis uh, in the U.S. in 2008, 2009, when the fir- when the Federal Reserve first wheeled out the the, the initial iteration of quantitative easing. Um, the dollar did come under come under some pressure as uh, the global supply of dollars uh, increased dramatically. Um, uh, now all central banks um, are in the same situation at the moment, and there's uh, there's very little um, room for I would say fundamental discrimination uh, amongst currencies, the major currencies at least at this point. Interest rates are effectively at zero or, or below that for most major central banks. We know that most major economies will see very significant declines in GDP. Um, growth, higher unemployment over the course of the next few months. Uh, we know that most governments are going to be borrowing heavily to try and offset the um, uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on domestic economies. Um, and the only differentiation, perhaps, is just how far down that road these central banks will go. And I think the Federal Reserve has immense firepower here um, to deploy to try and um, ensure that the US economy stabilizes as quickly as possible. And I think that will count... Uh, against the US dollar to some extent, um, because we will see, I think, that the Federal Reserve's balance sheet grow dramatically in the course of the next few months. We've seen a, a one trillion increase in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet just in the month of March alone. And that process is likely to continue um, going forward. And uh, I think eventually that weighs on the US dollar is in essence. And we, we do expect in the second half of the year, the US dollar to, to pull back a little bit, um, a little bit more, obviously. What's what's the big thing you're looking for in, in, in April? Boiling it down to one big thing is is going to be kind of difficult. I think um, a, a couple of things I think is to keep in on. It, the, the, um, the equity markets fell dramatically um, in March, and we have seen signs that uh, maybe investors are starting to um, discount the worst here. There was a uh, what was termed a, a dash for trash in the equity markets with um, investors rushing into the more beaten down stocks um, in um, in this week or so, uh, bargain hunting essentially to try and uh, buy some of the more depressed equities. Um, it, it's still probably a little too early in the process to de- determine whether um, a low is really in for equity markets at this point. We've seen a significant rally um, off the lows. The S&P 500 is 20% higher than um, the, the lows we had just a week or so ago, so um, a significant rebound already. It's going to be 
hard to sustain that pace of gain, um, however, given the backdrop that we have of slow growth, higher unemployment, and the uncertainty uh, around how the uh, virus will develop from here. So I rather think that um, a risk appetite is perhaps going to be the big driver of, um, uh, of currency markets in the short to medium term. So over the course of the next uh, month or so, if we can see risk appetite strengthen, that's to say equity markets um, rally uh, a little bit more, that should be good for the Canadian dollar. If, on the other hand, we um, move to retest the, uh, the lows that we had in the S&P 500 or the other major US indices um, in, in late March, that's probably going to weigh on the Canadian dollar to some extent. Um, so I think the, the outlook for equities volatility essentially um, is probably going to be in the short run here, at least the determinant of whether um, the CAD gains um, two or three cents from here or if it drops back uh, uh, two or three cents from current levels. That was Sean Osborne, Managing Director and Chief Currency Strategist at Scotiabank. Be sure to tune in for further episodes of Market Points and you can find more thought-leading content from Scotiabank on our website at gbm.scotiabank.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. And of course, thanks for listening.